If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, and share so we can find others like yourself. BitcoinBasicsPodcast.com But if you fail to press that button, let's say twice in a row, or some other designated uh, you know, missed windows, then it'll be presumed that you have died. And then whatever steps, um, whatever mechanisms for in case of death, those will begin to kick in. So it's the, the, the main overarching goal here is that your Bitcoin will never disappear into the atmosphere, but rather there will be something in place, either beneficiary designations or like, I, like I'm about to talk about unclaimed property, but at least there, it'll go somewhere and it will be at least somewhat recoverable and it's easy to prevent. You just got to keep pressing that red button every three months, six months, maybe every year, depends on the situation or what's the best practice that gets set up. Welcome to the Bitcoin Basics Podcast with your hosts Ferris, that's me, and Gordon from CoinCompass.com, enabling you to safely buy and securely store your Bitcoins. All resources are in the show notes and description, including our full disclaimer. Visit BitcoinBasicsPodcast.com to subscribe and discover other free content. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of uh, Bitcoin Basics Podcast. I'm your host, Ferris, here with Gordon. And Gordon, tonight we've actually got a very special guest. Yeah, we sure do. But before we actually um, introduce him, how about we go through the proof of recording? So, Thank you. I just realized I forgot about that. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you had it. All right, I've got it. Today is uh, 21st of April, 2020. The current block height is 626,995. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the blockchain current block number, according to Blockstream. And the current price of Bitcoin is $6,829 US, according to Bitstamp. Today, we have the pleasure of Anthony Park, or should I say Anthony S. Park? What what do you go by, Anthony? Uh, Anthony Park's fine. Anthony S. Park for the URL. <laughs> okay. Good plug in there. So um, how about you? we start off and you introduce yourself. Who is Anthony Park? Sure. Thank you so much for having me on. I love talking about my work as an executor and an estate attorney, and I'm very interested in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Um, so as a executor and attorney, I have over 20 years experience. That's exclusively what I do. Um, my sort of niche is that I am the executor. I'm not just the attorney. I am the person the family chooses to put in charge when a loved one passes away. Let's say, for example, grandma passes away in New York, but all the nieces and nephews are in the UK or somewhere overseas. Uh, they usually need somebody here. Uh, to run the process, run the U.S. taxes and courts, and they hire me to do that, not just be the attorney. So I actually have very, very um, hands-on experience with settling the affairs of somebody who's died, or many times over, hundreds of times actually. But in terms of my experience with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, I am very new. <laughs> um, I, I do, I am holding, but um, you know, I, I, you'll tell as the conversation goes on. There's a limit to what I know. But uh, I do understand what happens when people die. So that's where I'm coming from. What happens to your Bitcoin when you die, Anthony? I am holding through one of the larger exchanges under which I have, uh, I believe I have, I will have beneficiary designations soon. And for anyone who doesn't know what that means, uh, just like a life insurance policy or your 401k, uh, you can name a beneficiary, which is to whom your account will automatically go to upon your death. It doesn't even have to go through the probate courts. That's the uh, the court process when somebody dies. You get to skip all that, which is great. Um, so I don't. Th I think they're in the process of rolling that out. So as of now, then my executor, the person named in my will to take over my estate, in my case, my spouse, will. Well, once she gets the court authority, she can just go to. I think I'm with Coinbase, <laughs> and. Um, she can just file the paperwork with them and they will turn over the account access to her, which is very similar to you know, a Vanguard or E-Trade brokerage account or something that most people, most non-crypto um, you know, enthusiasts would be familiar with and comfortable with, if that makes sense. Cool. Thanks, Anthony. Um, 
Yes, this is something Gordon and I come across quite often, and it's a discussion that we've had as well, is where do I keep my Bitcoins? Do I keep them on the exchange or do I remove them and put them into my own personal wallet or cold storage device? Um, so, yeah, without divulging your personal information, is there a reason you chose to keep your Bitcoins on the exchange and not remove them? Pretty much simplicity's sake. Um, I looked into hardware wallets. I think the ones my friends are using are t Tether. Does that sound familiar? Yep. Tether, yeah. <laughs> um, it just sounded very complicated. And as I just described, for somebody like me, which I think I think I represent a larger population than the hardcore enthusiasts, <laughs> it just it's a nice it's a nice gateway drug. It's a nice entry point to have a entity or institution that feels more comfortable. I understand that I'm losing kind of a lot of the point of holding cryptocurrencies in terms of um, being decentralized and perhaps not, uh, not having a large target where my crypto is being held. I did read about the Mt. Gox hack and, and things of that nature. Um, but I think the risk of my holdings disappearing upon my death because, or at, at any time because nobody knows about them, is... Um, it's probably in my circumstance a higher risk than a large exchange, you know, getting hacked into oblivion, if that makes sense. I have a million questions for you, Anthony. And often on uh, these kind of podcasts, we say, you know, not legal advice, not tax advice, not investment advice, but can we actually say this is legal advice? Um, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I try not to run away from stuff like that. And I do feel like when you give those disclaimers before you speak, um, it's kind of like, why am I listening to you then? So yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> okay. Fantastic, Ferris. I've achieved one of my uh, crypto goals. Uh, but the point is, it could be legal advice within Anthony's jurisdiction. We're talking three different countries here. <laughs> That's true. But then again, where is the server? Where are we actually communicating in a country or online? <laughs> <laughs> um, so how about we go through estate planning? What is, I think most people know what estate planning is in, in the broader sense, but why is it important for people who have Bitcoin and Bitcoin investments? Yes. Yeah, so it's narrowly estate planning narrowly for folks, for, you know, for the context of our conversation, it has to do with two things. Who gets your stuff when you die and who's in charge of making that transfer happen? Those are the two real questions that we're trying to answer with your estate plan. And the most common mechanism is a will, right? And a will is a document that you file with the court. And what it does is it says, okay, anything that was still in you know, Gordon's name when he passed, we've appointed somebody, the person in charge, you know, let's you say your spouse or, or Ferris <laughs> is your executor who will have the legal authority to go around or call or you know, log into all the bank accounts and have the legal authority to transfer them to, I'm simplifying this a lot, but transfer them to whoever you named as your, your heirs or beneficiaries in your will. Uh, it doesn't happen automatically. There's somebody actually who has to you know, go about the business of doing that. Um, as I mentioned earlier with the larger cryptocurrency exchanges, you also have the option of things called beneficiary designations. In that scenario, you're naming who gets your stuff when you die by naming a beneficiary. And there is no mechanism. Um, well, the mechanism is uh, you go to the exchange with the death certificate and they just give it to you. You don't have to go to court. So the person who you've named as your beneficiary, let's say your spouse, just takes your death certificate, goes to um, Kraken or wherever, <laughs> and they will, uh, you know, once they've confirmed that it's an authentic death certificate and that you are in fact the person who was named as the beneficiary, they'll turn over the account to you. They don't uh, need to see any court proof. Um, and then, you know, I'm happy to talk about some of the newer and more detailed or you know, more thought out solutions, such as, uh, I think it's Casa Covenant, and then some of the more theoretical solutions for hardware, such as the dead man switch. Uh, those are very interesting to me. And um, yeah, whenever you want to jump into those. Just on that, Anthony, um, a lot of people have probably got like you said, you, you've got um, some Bitcoins on, on Coinbase and Kraken. I believe they're both US under US jurisdiction. What is the scope of the will? So, for example, if someone had their Bitcoins on Binance in the UK or Singapore or some of like that and they were a US citizen? 
It's a good question. So if I, I, I like to draw things back to analogies, I'm probably imperfect, but if I owned an account with Barclays or a, a bank, uh, a Korean bank, I'm, I'm Korean ethnically, <laughs> my parents are, my folks in Korea, um, if that entity had any ties to New York, they would most likely respect my U.S. executor. But if they didn't, then yes, I would have to do a second procedure. So I, my, my wife would be named a New York executor. You know, I pay for an attorney and go through all that. And then she would have to do a parallel procedure in the U.K. for the U.K. courts to also sort of um, acknowledge her as an executor. And then she could take that UK certificate called the grant of probate to Binance, I think it was, yeah. Which is very similar to somebody owning, let's say, real estate, like a condo here and another piece of real estate overseas. It kind of parallels that example. You, you can't just use one jurisdiction's um, court authority in, in, you know, across the world. <laughs> Right. And, and when you say probate, you mean having to then go through the courts or, or probate court as opposed to non-probate, like not having to go through that process? Is that what you mean? Cor correct. So the beneficiary, naming a beneficiary on your life insurance, that's the best example of something that's non-probate. Again, you just go to the brokerage or institution with a death certificate and you, you never have to set foot in court, which is, can be really great. Uh, for anything that's name that doesn't have a beneficiary designation, and that's in your name alone, yes, you do have to go to the court process. And what that means is you're you're taking the will to the court, and the court has to you know they have to make sure it really is a original will, not a photocopy, or make sure pages haven't been swapped out, it was actually witnessed, all that all that good stuff. Make sure it's legit, um, and that and that's what that process is about: making sure this actually reflects your wishes. And it could be a lengthy process and expensive. <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I also think that people perhaps might think that estate planning is designated, a designating beneficiary. So for example, with the Bitcoin example you gave with Coinbase, I mean, can, with, with an exchange, can you actually designate a, a beneficiary or a trust? Uh, one or two have, uh, and I believe each of them have announced that that is something that they're rolling out. Um, that's a solution that as soon as it's more widely available, I would actually encourage any friends or clients to to take advantage of that, only if only because it's so familiar and it, it'll have probably the fewest headaches um, in just until other form, uh, until other techniques get a better, a stronger foothold, as it were. Uh, Anthony, um, I know New York was kind of... Um where a lot of the f regulations first came in for Bitcoin. Um, is that an ongoing target? You just having to keep up with what's happening in the regulatory space with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? Not so much. Uh, I, my understanding is that the, the regulatory scheme, is, you know, especially with New York, has mostly to do with what exchanges are allowed to hold and offer and things more in that realm. Uh, I'm mostly concerned. I mean, that's important, obviously, but um, my expertise and my the value that I'm trying to add to this conversation is more about, okay, you have it and you're dead. <laughs> um, so how do I help you, your family or your heirs transfer that ownership? Uh, that really, I haven't seen a lot. I really haven't seen much conversation or regulation in that area. Um, and, it, and it needs to happen because People are going to die, and you're going to have situations like the the Mellon Bank heir, whose uh, whose millions, if not billions, were allegedly lost. Yeah. Apologies, we're kind of jumping around uh, the place at the moment, and um, I'm itching to ask some Bitcoin questions because I, I I think it's fascinating the whole custodianship of Bitcoin exchange versus, for example, wallet or something. Like that. I I find it fascinating. And it's fascinating for the people who are living, but uh, obviously once you've, once you've um, passed away, it's, it gets perhaps a bit tricky. So I was actually thinking about this this afternoon. I bet, I, I don't know, I'm just assuming here, Anthony, I bet a lot of people have got, and I actually did find some blog posts online, and I couldn't believe it. I think this is a horrible idea, but feel free to um, disagree. A lot of people are putting details like their passwords, usernames, private keys, all kinds of stuff in their will, in the actual will. That to me sounds like a horrible idea because 
you know, how many people are going to have access to that will? And in, in most countries, that will is public anyway. So is that, is, is that terrible or? That is a horrible, horrible idea. And right. uh, any attorney who does that is, um, is looking at some trouble. <laughs> okay. uh, so to answer your question, yes, the will passes through a lot of hands, um, not just the client and the attorney, but you have paralegals and staff who are, who's, you know, who are, who are copying it or revising it. You have the witnesses and the notary at the actual signing. And in some jurisdictions and in New York, you, some folks choose to store it with the court for safekeeping. So you have court clerks. Um, I mean, it's just not a good idea to store the complete keys in there. And that sort of is leading us down to the path of how we arrive at some of the solutions we talk about, uh, we're going to talk about. But um, so one solution to that is to leave part of the key. Let's just say um, you cut your key in two, or, you know, I hope you understand what I mean, the number of digits. The first half is the A section of the, of the key. And the second half is the B section. So you give the you you write the B section in the will. This is not something I'm recommending. I'm just saying this has been discussed. <laughs> and then somebody else has the A section, and you can only do anything with them if you combine the two, right? So that's sort of the simplified the first the jumping off point uh, from from where we get to some of the more complicated solutions we'll talk about in a moment. All right. Well, let's get into them. I, I can think of some horrible solutions. For example, writing your uh, private keys in a will or um, storing on a USB and you've got, you know, a million dollars worth of Bitcoin or USB, but no one actually knows about it. And, you know, that USB gets thrown out with the CD-ROM collection or some of like that. Um, and everything in between, like giving it to a family member and sort of um, basically making them protect the, you know, the backup phrases and backup seeds and all kinds of stuff. So how about we get into some, well, do you want to go through maybe some bad examples that you've, thought about or people have actually come up with so that we can then go through some best practices? Sure. I have, I have one more bad example I'd like to talk about before right. we go into the, uh, the better versions. And the bad example is storing your passphrases or private keys in a safe deposit box. And the reason this is a bad idea, I mean, look, some of these things are not likely to cause problems, but I just, I'm, I'm making folks aware of what are the elements so that you can decide for yourself if those are risks you want to take. So the problem with the safe deposit box is, upon death, the way to get access to the safe deposit box involves at least three people present and a report. Okay, so there's going to be the executor, the attorney, and probably two bank officers in the room when the thing is opened. So there you have just a lot of folks with eyeballs on your keys or your phrases. <laughs> but on top of that, at least in New York, the bank has an obligation to file an inventory and file it as a public record with the court. Now, it's unclear to me if the inventory will read, you know, a long string of jibber jabber numbers and, and words, or if it will actually list the keys. And that would become a public record, which, if, you know, that would not be great, obviously. <laughs> so for that reason, I'm not a fan of at least having your phrases in a, US, uh, in a safe deposit box. I oh, really appreciate it. I think that's something that, um, yeah, we, you just don't think of it unless you hear an insider. So, um, so what is the, yeah, the inventory inside the box? Everything gets labeled and is accessible via public records. That's, that's fascinating. I mean, the reason is if you think about it, it, um, think you have to think backwards a little bit. You have to think, you know, that movie casino, it's going to be, they're worried about a box full of cash and jewelry and they're worried that somebody will, you know, pocket something. That is the mentality behind these procedures. And it's just not really thought forward for new situations. So that's, that's why those procedures exist is what I'm saying. <laughs> so let's go through some uh, possible scenarios. I think you mentioned in, in an email a couple of those, but do you want to go through perhaps the couple of um, common solutions out there? I've thought, I've thought of a few sort of off the wall ones, but uh, I'll leave it with you first. So the two that I've thought the most about are one that's being offered by a company called uh, CASA, and their, their offering is called CASA Covenant. I have no connection to them. It's, I just think what they're doing is interesting. And then later I'll talk about the solution that is not currently, uh, at least I'm not aware, is not currently being offered or rolled out by anyone, but I think is actually the most elegant solution. And that one is generally called a dead man switch. Um, but why don't we start with CASA Covenant? So yeah, CASA, 
Okay, Casa is, um, I think their name to fame, their claim to fame is multi-sig solutions. Have you guys heard about that? Is that something I can, I, I won't embarrass myself by trying to explain? <laughs> no, no, we've, we've covered that before and people can look through our past episode on wallets. Yeah, we've, we've covered that. Perfect. Well, well briefly, uh, what they do uh, for non-death situations is they break up some kind of access to your, to your wallet into uh, multiple parts of a signature, hence multi-sig. And you need three of five of the parts to have access, to, to be able to transact. What they do for, uh, for situations of death is they, they just make it, they add one. They, uh, they make it three of six. And they're they're usually adding your estate attorney as one of your key hold, one of your signature holders or multi sig holders. I'm not, I'm not sure what verbiage they like to use there. And so the theory is, if you pass away, sure, the section of the or the sig that you held is is probably gone, and the, the sig on your phone is probably gone. But uh, your executor or the courts can go to let's say Casa as a company for one of one of six your estate attorney for another one of six. And then it's a little vague where the third one comes from, whether it's the sick deposit box or somewhere else. But the point is um, you're not trusting any one person. You do need, um, let's call outside or third party authority for uh, multiple third party authorities uh, to, to gain access. And that's sort of where, you know, by spreading the liability around the theory is that, uh, you know, both CASA as an entity and your attorney would, would want to be pretty darn sure that you're actually dead and that the, uh, the person who is attempting to claim access has legal authority and, um, and that that's kind of the, the safeguard there. Uh, so interesting and it solves a lot of the trust issues, but, um, it also, to me, uh, hmm, how do I put this? It seems to be trying to replace the court system and that has pros and cons to it. So you're replacing the court system. Oh, yes, please. Go ahead, Gordon. Oh, I was just going to say, um, yeah, I can definitely see extra responsibility and perhaps pressure on those key holders. Like, for example, if there were, I don't know, some sort of creditors or tax or um, other entities, actually, I don't, I don't know if they could actually know who the key holders were, but you would definitely make those people vulnerable, I think, would be one of the disadvantages. Oh, absolutely. You hit it right on the head. Bravo. Um, that's my major concern. So by making key holders sort of almost gatekeepers and decision makers, theoretically, um, you know, I don't know how it's exactly it's going to play out legally, but theoretically, they hold some liability. So that, uh, here's the example I like to use. There's something called a spousal election. If um, if somebody tries to completely disinherit their spouse and just kind of you know, kind of screw over their spouse, <laughs> most states have a rule where you can't do that, and the spouse has the option of saying, "No, no, 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 you can't completely cut me off. I get a third. I get to elect. I raise my hand and elect to get a third, no matter what you say." And that applies not just to the will, but any other assets in the universe, which could include your your Bitcoin or your cryptocurrency. So now you have a situation where CASA and your state attorney and whoever the third multi sig holder is, they need to know about that. <laughs> they need to make sure that they're not accidentally or inadvertently releasing funds when they should have been holding a third for their surviving spouse. And that's kind of a niche situation. I wouldn't say, go so far as to say it's, a, it's like a long tail situation. It happens a lot. Um, but it's, 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 um, it's unknown enough that there, you know, CASA might let it go through. <laughs> <laughs> or, or one of the you know multi stakeholders might not think of that. Um, so that's just one example of many where yes, like you're saying, creditors or unknown taxes might pop up, and there is a risk of liability to those multi stakeholders. But that's my major concern there. Yeah, I could see that a huge problem, especially if those people were known. Um, and I wouldn't want to personally put my family under that kind of pressure. You know, if someone uh, got to my sister and said, "Hey," um, you got to pay up because uh, God knows this amount of tax or whatever. And also what, what would happen in that situation if she was coerced or basically pressured into giving away some of those keys where the other key holders didn't give away those keys? What, what kind of legal situation would that be? One more, I'm not quite getting that situation, that scenario, if, if you don't mind elaborating. It, 
if for example, well, I, I think you mentioned a three of six multi multi sig setup. Um, what what would happen if say the family members, but not the attorney or um, two other uh, entities, gave up their keys, but the others didn't? And basically, it was it was not lawful. They basically were coerced into doing it, or somehow extorted, or something. Well, I think that goes to how you set up your keys. Meaning, you would never want to have a situation where three keys would be that vulnerable. Maybe only one of the six would be with family members, and the remaining five would be planned out in such a way that that could not happen. Right? You wouldn't have three sections of the keys with um, folks with the same pressure points. I guess you would. Is the theory? It's interesting, you know. It's not perfect, but it's definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I really like the multi-sig setup um, for living people. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I can definitely see some uh, disadvantages for the extra responsibility and pressure put on those key holders. Do you want to learn how to safely buy and securely store your bitcoins? CoinCompass.com is running a free two-hour webinar on Sunday, 31st of May. To register and for more details, visit coincompass.com forward slash webinar. We have one possible solution, Anthony, with the multi-sig setup, and our listeners are familiar with multi-sig. Um, and I believe only Casa, Casa has uh, Casa Covenant and Unchained Capital have their vault. Do you know of any other solutions out there? No, those are the only two I'm familiar with. And actually, even Casa Covenant, I believe, is currently only available to, I think, their highest tier membership. So it's, it's actually quite expensive. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've got that. We've got some sort of multi-key set up. Do you want to walk us through how a dead man switch would work? Yes, this is the solution that I think you know, just in my opinion, should happen or should be the, should take the greatest toehold. Um, I'll talk about how generally the dead man switch works, and then I'll do a comparison of how existing abandoned property laws work and why that parallel just makes it the, my, my favorite solution. Let's put it that way. So uh, the dead man switch, everyone describes it with a, an analogy to the TV show 24, but I never watched 24. So do you guys understand that reference? <laughs> No, actually, I don't. I think what it means is um, when you let go of something, so when you die, it blows up, basically is how it works. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember that from an old uh, G.I. Joe comic I read as a kid. But uh, anyway, so uh, re relative to accounts, what it means is something along, this, along these lines. I'm going to use a very, very uh, visual, but it's, this is not actually what it would be. But there will be a button. Like, let's imagine a big red button that you have to press every, every three months or every six months, some designated period of time. And it's, it's, it, should, it needs to be easy to do. <laughs> it can't be some kind of onerous thing. Um, but if you fail to press that button, let's say twice in a row or some other designated uh, you know, missed windows, then it'll be presumed that you have died. And then whatever steps... Um, whatever mechanisms for in case of death, those will begin to kick in. So it's the, the, the main overarching goal here is that your Bitcoin will never disappear into the atmosphere, but rather there will be something in place, either beneficiary designations or like, I, like I'm about to talk about unclaimed property, but at least there, it'll go somewhere and it will be at least somewhat recoverable and it's easy to prevent. You just got to keep pressing that red button every three months, six months, maybe every year, depends on the situation or what's the best practice that gets set up. Uh, I hope I've explained that well. Does that make sense in terms of how death, uh, dead man switches work? Yeah, no, it does make sense. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, so then I'd love to talk about how existing abandoned property laws work. And then I think you'll, you'll very quickly see the parallel and why I think it's the best solution. Okay. Yeah, please So do. with exist... Yeah, so existing accounts, your bank accounts, your brokerage accounts, because any asset, there are already on the books and already in the uh, economy, uh, in the business world, systems and laws that deal with property that is deemed abandoned, right? So let's take a bank account, for example. 
if a bank did, uh, deems that you, you this, is, this is a dormant account, if there's been no activity, if they failed to get in touch with you for X number of attempted contacts, and there's a whole, you know, very, very detailed checklist of what has to occur or what has to fail to occur before an account is deemed abandoned. But once those, uh, once those items have taken place, then again, there's a whole checklist of what happens. Then it usually means the account as cheats, fancy legal word, for the, uh, the account is deemed abandoned and goes into this, I'm going to call it a slush fund, <laughs> uh, in the state uh, where the account was held. But it doesn't disappear. It doesn't cease to become your money. It's just being held there for your benefit. And you or your heirs or your estate can always recover it so long as you have the proper documentation to prove you are who you are or you are the executor for the estate. So, so my point is that there is a structure that prevents, let's say, bank accounts and brokerage accounts from disappearing uh, so that you're in, in, in a way that your heirs would never never get them. So why not just simply apply that same or similar structure to your cryptocurrency? And then sort of the logic and the, um, the, the workflow is, will be very familiar to both the courts and uh, estate attorneys. There's, there's, very new, there's very little new thinking that has to be done. And I think that's important realistically to make things work on a larger scale. Um, and that's why I, I generally think at least first step, a dead man's t switch type of setup um, is the best way to minimize, you know, sort of catastrophic loss of, of cryptocurrency upon, upon somebody's death. So practically, would that work for cryptocurrency something like if I don't show some sort of activity or if I don't do something, you know, within a certain time period, a month or six months or however it was set up, then uh my pre-designed pre pre-designated bitcoin address is sent you know all the money or half the money or however it's however it's set up exactly um so just to give you a, a sense of reference uh for bank accounts i think it's three years same with brokerage accounts it has to have appeared it has it must have, must appear to have been dormant for that long before any of this kicks in um, so it's not like you'll have to constantly be refreshing every month. <laughs> it won't be that quite that uh, no, uh, you know cumbersome. Uh, what what the exact mechanism looks like, I'm not sure what works best. Um, I'd love to have that conversation with you, you guys, or just maybe any developer out there who wants to talk to a, an experienced state attorney and wants to jump in on this. I, I would love to be involved. But um, something along the lines of either a beneficiary designation or or just going to the state. The state would love to own. A, I'm, you know, I don't know if it should liquidate because I don't know that the state is equipped to hold keys. <laughs> I, don't, I, I kind of doubt it. <laughs> so it might have to be a liquidation order. That's, I know that sounds terrible, but remember, it's three years of inactivity, three years of failing to press the button theoretically before any of this kicks in. And if you really want to make sure that uh, the crypto itself in kind transfers to yours, then maybe there's a mechanism for a beneficiary designation, something along those lines. Um, Anthony, the world of Bitcoin is incredibly fascinating. There's always new developments happening and there's still a huge knowledge gap for people just getting in. Where do you go to get your information to keep up to date with things? So I know the answer, but I'm a little, I'm not sure if this is a, I'm embarrassing myself to admit it, but basically Twitter. <laughs> No, no fin, fin Twitter and crypto is huge. Yeah, look, that's that's where you go to get the first stuff. Absolutely. Okay, cool. I thought I was uh, <laughs> just exposing myself there. <laughs> no, there's there's Fin Twit and then there's crypto Twitter. So um, I mean, that's that's where I first went in twenty. I joined Twitter for the reasons of following these guys about Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a good way to narrow down what I need to do further research into. It's not just on Twitter. Just to be clear. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Twitter points you in another direction. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. The problem with Twitter is there's so much noise and there are so many scams and there are so many um, other crypto, not not the other crypto projects about or anything that, but uh, there's there's a lot of noise. You, you got to you gotta search for that uh, needle in the haystack. But uh, I guess that's like anything. You look at podcasts or YouTube or whatever. So uh, there's definitely a lot of information out there. I wouldn't say there's a lot of, Great information out there, but uh, yeah, you got to sift through it. 
if people are listening to this, they might have a will, but they haven't updated it with any crypto uh, assets or anything like that. Where do you suggest, like what, what, what are the best practices? How do people get started? I, I always try to answer uh, with real world and sort of, I'm not very academic. I'm very, very real world, real world based. So my first question is, uh, who do you want to receive the crypto? Let's say it's your spouse or your adult children. And do you know? just realistically, will they have any idea what, what that even is? Because a lot of people don't. Um, so, uh, Gordon, uh, would your loved ones know even where to begin uh, if, if you handed them a USB? <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and if- oh, you don't want to ask Gordon that. Gordon would have built them the USB from spare parts he found under rubbish. Hey man, I've got my own custom solutions for that. I'm not going <laughs> to say what they are on a public podcast. But no, yeah, sorry, Anthony, keep going. Well, that actually speaks to my point. So, whatever custom solution you have, which I think I'm, I'm sure is remarkable, would your loved ones even be able to begin to understand how to access those? Right. That that, that would definitely struggle. But I've I've built it <laughs> um, well enough to be idiot proof. So. Um, yeah, I, I think that would be able to follow it. Well, my um, my perspective, if I if I may share this with you, is that even things seemingly as simple as accessing a bank account or somebody's IRA, things that are you would expect to be easy enough, actually become quite difficult after uh, after somebody's passing. And I, I don't mean even just in the month, in the weeks, or even few months after passing during the grieving period, but um, it's just harder than you imagine to step into somebody else's shoes and um, you know, just you're remembering somebody else's social security number, somebody else's mother's maiden name, all this stuff that you have to do just to access even conventional assets. Um, I, can just, I can imagine it'll be even harder with less, conven- I'm just gonna call them less conventional uh, assets. So anyway, with that in mind, um, just design accordingly or, or speak to, you know, if, if, if if your loved ones, you're very confident they won't have any much trouble with that, then you know you might not have to do much estate planning because they'll just know how to get to your custom bunker or whatever you have <laughs> set up there. Um, <laughs> whereas if it's if it's <laughs> if it's a spouse who's a little less familiar, then yes, you probably want to think about something more traditional like a beneficiary designation or a dead man switch that'll just execute for them, right? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely still a uh, lot of. A lot of room for um, education in Bitcoin in, yeah, in so many different industries as well. Yeah, so just think, almost think of your, your loved ones or your heirs as your customers and that uh, your estate plan is the UI you need to design. Mm-hmm. You got to think about them, mm-hmm. not what you'd be able to solve you know, or work with. Um, and just think about them in a very um, not great state of mind. Even if they're past the grieving stage, just, mm. it's, just it's a pain. <laughs> uh, you know, mm. managing somebody else's investment property again, drawing it to more traditional um, frameworks, that's a pain too. Like, oh, when do the when do I collect rent from this guy? Does he direct deposit? Do I have to go to get cash from him? All those little things, even in, again, even in traditional scenarios, are huge pain. So um, just just keep that in mind. Just I'm just sort of sharing with you what I do on an everyday basis. <laughs> No, we've got to be practical here. And, and Faris and I um, discuss quite often on the podcast, security is sometimes the enemy of convenience. Mm-hmm. So sometimes something's super convenient, super simple, but it's not as secure. And uh, sometimes something's uh, incredibly secure, but it's not very convenient. So it's, it's a trade-off. So everything is a trade-off and it depends on you know technical ability and what you're willing to sacrifice, what you're willing to consider. So uh, yeah. Um, I don't think, uh, like, like with everything in Bitcoin, there's no one size fits all. So, uh, it's probably a custom, custom solution based on, uh, who your heirs are and how technically savvy they are, I guess. I've heard one suggestion, uh, we can wrap up on this, but, um, the one suggestion I've heard, I'm not sure how I feel about this, but I'm happy to talk about it is to have a cryptocurrency executor, sort of a second executor specifically for that section of assets. And there's a precedent for this. Uh, Authors or creators will often have a literary executor 
whose sole job is managing the copyrights and royalties from just ongoing work, the works that have generate income after, continuously after death. So there is a precedent or, a, you know, there, have been, there are instances where you have a sort of separate sub-executor for just that asset. And um, you might consider that if, you, if your spouse or loved ones just, won't be, just simply won't be able to wrap their heads around, um, around how you've set your things up. Maybe you have a trusted friend and have them as a, again, court-appointed crypto executor. So they do have sort of, um, in terms of trust, they do have obligations to the court and liability to the court so that they'll, you know, they'll do it correctly. But they also have the expertise that maybe your adult child or spouse won't have who, who would serve as the just general executor. Oh, that's fascinating. I never actually considered that. Thanks for that. Sure. Um, okay. Well, I think we could wrap it up there. Uh, I could go on and on about custodial solutions and the advantages and disadvantages of both the custodial and non-custodial. But uh, don't write your private keys in your will, people. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, correct. I was just going to say, Anthony, if people want to find out more about you, where do they go? Sure. My, uh, my website is anthonyspark.com. And uh, if you just look up Anthony S. Park on Amazon, I have a couple of books on estate planning and personal finance. That's really the best way to get to know me, as it were. Fantastic. Well, thanks again, Anthony. And um I'm sure you have uh, sparked some interest, especially during this current environment where I, I heard that both Casa and Unchained Capital were having more and more requests for, for their services, for their estate planning services. So now's a good time to update your wills and think about uh, your heirs and how they would be able to get access to your uh, crypto treasures if something happened to you. And um, yeah, good to have an expert on so that Faris and I aren't just... Uh, talking blowing into the wind but we're actually uh got a bona fide expert on so thanks thanks again and um we'll link to uh some of your books well all of your books in the show notes of this video thanks guys for having me thanks anthony thanks for watching or listening please visit coincompass.com free to register to our socials and discover other free content subscribing liking and following helps this content remain ad free until next time